Ladies and gentlemen, I, um, I talk quite a lot, so that's why I put this tiny boxwood sculpture from around 1600 of a, of a boy shouting while being stung by a bee. So if I have to uh, shut up, just um, send some bees to me. Um, and I'd also like to, to give the possibility, if you'd like to ask questions um, after my, uh, my talk, you're more than welcome to. The Rijksmuseum, as it looks today, after a transformation of Miguel already said it, of 10 years, um, we had a lot of time, so there was no excuse to do things only halfway. It is now the garden with a um, very vivid uh, fountain by an artist, Jeppe Hein, and yesterday I saw on the banks of the river many children in their swimming trunks, jumping in and out, and that's what I see every day from the office. A garden that's a present to the city, and with over two million, about two and a half million visitors a year, the Rijksmuseum is in Amsterdam. It's thoroughly Dutch, but it's there for the world to enjoy. It started in 1885, with a building that caused a lot of outcry in the city of Amsterdam. It is the State Museum, and interestingly enough, as the Netherlands is a thoroughly democratic country, the architects, Cruz y Ortiz, at a certain point said this is a perversion of democracy. The city donated to the state a piece of land. Usually it's the other way around. But the city donated to the state a piece of land in 1885 with the message that they could build a museum, but it should also um, function as a gateway to the city. Behind, there were no buildings yet. It was on the, on the corner of the city, um, heading towards the south, and it should be a gateway. That created, I think, one of the most incredible museum buildings, because it is a museum, and how many do we have in the world? It is a museum with a road running straight through it, or rather, a cycle path running straight through it. And if it wasn't for the cycle path, during the 10 years of renovation, we would have had no publicity at all. But the cyclists wanted to cycle through the museum. Open or closed, they had to get their way. And I think it is fantastic because it is so typical Dutch that you can cycle through a museum and it is a museum that's open to the public for all. In 1885, the architect Kuipers made a very distinctive building. And you will hear Spain is on the one hand a chip on our shoulder in the Netherlands, but on the other hand, it brought us to great height. Amsterdam, the Netherlands, a thoroughly Protestant country. After its independence as a small country from Spain in 1648, it always wanted to prove that it was really Protestant. And what happened? Kuipers, a Catholic architect, built a cathedral for the arts. A cathedral that had to house the national collections not only of art, but also of applied art and of history. A cathedral and not a temple. Most museums all modelled on the British Museum were temples, but Kuipers had a very clear idea the Netherlands should become Catholic again. So when the museum opened, he was also involved in another project, this was on the south side of the city, in another project, which was a cathedral for trains, the central station, which unlocked the city to Paris, Brussels, Berlin, and it caused, in, again, a huge influx of people who came to visit his cathedral for the arts. 
it was so polemic that when the king was asked to open the museum in 1885, he refused to go and said, I will not set foot in this monastery of Spanish origin. During the 20th century, and I will tell you a bit about it later, the Dutch did everything to deny their Spanish origin and to deny the Catholic character of the building. Kuypers had a very clear idea in mind. He wanted it to be the museum for the Dutch and of the Dutch. And that gives a very typical um, character to the museum that it really has in contrast, for example, to the Prado or in contrast to the National Gallery in London or the Louvre. It has mainly Dutch works of art, all works of art that had to do with the former colonies in the Netherlands. But it was a building that was far too much for actually, or far too big for what the collections actually had. The collections had been housed in the town hall, by then the um, palace of the city, because from the beginning of the, of the 19th century we had a king. Um, they'd been housed in one of the canal houses, and then suddenly they went to the largest building in the Netherlands. His solution for this was easy. He had an artist, Sturm, paint the walls that did not have uh, paintings on them. And the artist had to create scenes from history that we did not have in the collection. On the outside of the building, you have many sculptures of what they say in Italian, the Romani Famosi, the important Dutchman. And on the side, you had tiles, tableau, depicting important scenes from Dutch history. Or at least what he thought were important scenes. And he recreated scenes which were Catholic, scenes that had been written out of the Dutch school books, but that now children could see that the Netherlands shouldn't be Protestant at all. It was very eclectic. He chose um, to represent in the building, as it was too big, he chose um, to represent all Dutch building styles, obviously, in a sense, inspired by the South Kensington Museum in London, now the V&A. Um, it opened a few years after the V&A. He only used Dutch materials. And in, on the first floor, the Bel Etage, he had, um, he had planned to have also interiors that reflected the um, architecture of Dutch churches. A building that in that sense was quite difficult to function as a museum mainly for paintings. The collections started to grow very soon and very fast because the people of the Netherlands started to do donate their treasures to the museum. It had a very simple floor plan, and here you see the first floor with, you see here written, the Ere Galerie, the Gallery of Honor, or as the Americans say when they come, the Dutch Hall of Fame. Um, then you had a, a, the front hall. You would walk, you would go into the museum here, all there. You would walk in a processional route on the stairs, um, arrive at the front hall, which was decorated like a church, you will see it later, with stained glass windows, and then enter and walk to the Rembrandt room with here the night watch. And indeed, the building was projected as a huge marketing campaign for the night watch, where in France you would have thought you'd have have Louis XIV on the high altar. In Italy, you would have Christ on the, on the cross. In the Netherlands, you have a huge painting with the burghers of the city of Amsterdam, the people that made the country. In that sense, the Netherlands has always felt itself to be, in a sense, even though we have a king and a queen, they are also burghers, and it is a civic country with a, a great feeling of 
of civic duty, and therefore the state provided the building, the people filled it with their treasures. Two courtyards, inner courtyards, that were always covered with a glass, um, a glass and a cast iron structure. Cowpers knew that, like in Bilbao, it rains a lot in the Netherlands. Um, and then you would walk around through rooms on filade, large rooms, um, and northern cabinets for the small cabinet pictures we all know so well by Vermeer, etc., with northern light. A very simple layout, um, which was made out always out of five by five um, measurements. So these rooms are five by five. Here you have 10 meters by 30 meters, and so forth, and so forth. <coughs> this is what happened during the 20th century. And the longer I study the history of the Rijksmuseum and other national museums, the more you see that they are, on the one hand, the builders of a nation, but on the other hand, also the reflection of a nation. So during the 20th century, not only did the Dutch fight the Catholic building and helped by modernism, painted it entirely white, only leaving the, the eye and cast iron beams of the construction in their original state, cast iron, they looked industrial, so that was accepted. But also, at the same time, after turning it into a Protestant white church, you could say, they um, democratized the building. The courtyards were built in, and the large rooms were all split up into very small rooms that had, as it was said at the time, this was in the 1950s, 60s, a more human scale that would not elevate the people but would come towards the people and it was in that sense democratized. It was literally built in. Here you see the courtyard being built in very quickly with uh, brick walls. And it was when in 2000 the Rijksmuseum received a millennial gift from the nation for renovation. It was really in bad need of repair. It had become completely dusty. And even worse, we discovered that the air conditioning was made out of asbestos so you know as soon as you find a little piece of asbestos in a building let alone the air conditioning you have to close overnight the country felt rich in 2000 and with a millennial gift of 100 million to the museum, we could start. The then director upset the prime minister hugely by saying, thank you very much, this is a nice beginning. And indeed, the project, and this is also typically Dutch, um, costs much more in the end. But if you would say it's, it's a project that's going to cost 400 million and will take 10 years, nobody would ever start. So he very smartly said, let's start and let's upset the country after a century even again. Let's start and let's select two Spanish architects to start building again in this way, which was once a cathedral of the arts. And also, I think Rembrandt would have probably turned in his grave that after he experienced the independence of this small country from Spain, two Spanish architects were going to build the nation's pride. Um, I always mix them up, even after a, a friendship of 15 years. These are Antonio Cruz and Antonio Ortiz. Very, very useful for me that they have the same name. And they won't forget mine either, as it is like Mexican food. So... Um, <laughs> They started, and I think they won the competition, which was very clever. They won the competition by doing two things, which are complete sacrilege in the world that is Amsterdam, a small city like Bilbao, even smaller, very tight-knit, um, and on the other hand, the world that is art history. You can wonder which one is stranger, but the world of art history was deeply shocked 
when they announced that they were going to do the renovation and that we would have less exhibition space when we would open again. And we made it into our motto, less is more. On the other hand, they did another thing. They, they started to, um, uh, to discuss the city gate concept and said, well, maybe the cyclists, they can cycle under the Rex Museum, but we will have to relay their cycle path for, um, I think it's in total, 7.2 meters. Well, if you touch somebody, if you want to really hurt somebody from Amsterdam, you touch their cycle path and you know what happens. They turn into a psychopath. <laughs> it hugely upset the public opinion and much delay was caused by the, um, by the getting of permits because the Netherlands is so democratic that whoever wants to make a complaint can stop the entire procedure of building. But... In 2005, we could start. And the clever idea was, as you, these are the inner courtyards, and I'll just go back. So this was uh, these spaces, which functioned, as they said, as the kind of length of the building. They give air to the building, where the Gallery of Honor is the artery. And what they said, and which, no, which nobody else had thought of, why don't we open up the inner courtyard um, to give it space again, to be able to breathe again, and to also make it the central entrance, one large atrium. The building was divided in two, par uh, two parts, as I showed, with two entrances. Now there is one large atrium where you enter. And I have to say, for the past five years, it worked fantastically well. Here you see the Kuipers roof and this is the, these were the building, um, the building um, structures where over the years we not only had galleries but we had all the offices in the museum etc etc and the, the other idea they had was we have to give the building back to the public so all the offices moved out and indeed now today the building is accessible every corner of the building is accessible and there's hardly any closet any um, office to be found within the building. And the other slogan was not going back to Kuipers, because as we, Kuipers was the original um, architect, because as we know, you can't go back in time, but going forwards with Kuipers and to embrace his architecture instead of trying to fight it. And something that made me, or me a big impression when I was started to work at the Rijksmuseum, I was working at Christie's in London, and everybody said, you're absolutely crazy, the museum is going to close. And I said, well, that's why I want to work there. Um, <laughs> because I knew that you would only get one chance in your life to transform or to be part of the transformation of the entire museum. And I was made responsible for the installations in the museum. And coming there, at the beginning, being a true art historian, I started to tell them how it used to be. And they said something that I will always remember, which was, Taco, we know history, but we like the future. And I think that's something for every museum, which is very important. But as simple as their, uh, their idea might be, um, as complicated it was to execute. Because when you are in the Netherlands, it's not like in Spain that you take a spade and you dig and you have a cellar. In the Netherlands, you need to hire a captain at sea because we're under sea level. And here you see the entire um, uh, renovation work underground had to be done by divers. And it was an incredibly complicated action. This is mainly because the upward 
forward power of the of, of the water is gigantic. When the museum was emptied of all the building courtyards, it was the entire building lifted a few centimeters, and when we opened, it had gone down a few centimeters again, just like a boat with somebody getting off and on. But through the entire process, also for the installation of the galleries, the important thing for us was always to arrive at simplicity. And as I said before, simplicity is usually the most complex thing to arrive at. And this is how it looks today, with the public entering here and going up the stairs to the galleries. It brings Spanish light, and it brings Spanish and Portuguese, because I think that that's still considered Spain, Portuguese materials. I say I think it's still considered Spain because the Netherlands have a relation, I think, slightly similar to the Spanish and the Portuguese, like Belgium has to the Netherlands. And the building itself is, in a sense, an expression of the Dutchness of the Dutch. When they started to build in 1885, they really wanted to create Dutch art and not Flemish art. Hence, you don't find Rubens, no Van Eyck, no Bruegel, no El Bosco. They're all not in the Rijksmuseum. And this was a very conscious decision to create a northern Netherlands art. These are large chandeliers. At the opening, there was a big discussion. And I have to say, luckily enough, there was one thing that people could talk about because the rest of the building was received with open arms. And this is the entrance hall, which used to be painted, and we will see later, a church interior that was really the example for this, um, to, for the transformation of this hall. It used to be painted over the 20th century entirely white, like a Dutch church. There was an organ hanging on this side and an organ hanging on the other side, just like a Dutch Protestant church. And it was reinstated installed in its original glory. The restorers, these are not frescoes, they're painted on canvas. It went so far that in the 1970s, in the period of secularization of the country, the restorers were ordered by the then general director to destroy these paintings um, so we could not be remembered of this period of the museum. And luckily enough, the employees don't always listen to the director, and they kept them, and they hid them in the attics, and we actually found them. We discovered them when we were um, starting the move from the museum, and we, we found them, we restored them, and here they are again. The stained glass windows, also remembering of a church with great Dutch men, like Kuypers obviously said, you have, you go from the earthly um, from the earthly uh, great man slowly up to the great man of the arts because the arts were considered highest and obviously the most important person, the architect at the center. The stained glass windows, by the way, you would say, why were they kept? Well, the Dutch are incredibly stingy, so they just always kept these windows because they served the goal. <laughs> Now, the installation of the galleries, again, it might look as something that's, um, that's rather um, easy to do, to go back to the original spaces of Kuipers, but it was actually a huge endeavor because we wanted to keep the rooms in their original volume. I think the most, the thickest build-up wall is four centimeters, which is really nothing. If you have to think that there are now different ideas about acclimatization and about light in the museum and all technology was put in there. 
I also have to admit that I myself became kind of obsessed by wanting to remove clutter. I remember that four months before opening at every, I think it is, but Norman Forster will know it better, but at every two meters there was a, an electricity socket, which is a European standard for electricity sockets, and I nearly single-handedly removed 2,000 electricity sockets from the rooms. And when talking to the workmen on the floor, I would explain to them, well, listen, this is where I would like to hang a Vermeer, and I don't want to have any electricity socket next to it. They luckily immediately understood, but there were many project managers in between who were sitting behind the desk whom you had to uh, convince. My advice would be, I, I only did a project of this scale once, but would be take care to have as little project managers as you can. <laughs> What do you do when you have an empty museum? That gives you a huge opportunity to rethink how you can serve the public best and how you can make the collections shine. Because the collections are more and more, and we at the museum more and more realized are what makes it unique and what makes it a destination. I remember walking through the, through the just rebuilt street after the awful fire in Lisbon and encountering Gucci, Fiac, Versace and so forth. In every city around the world you see the same shops. And I think the amazing thing of a museum is that you can actually see works that you can't see anywhere else. Museums should be uplifting. They should really make not dumbing down. People want to be uplifted and they want to be to belong and they want to see something very special when they go to the museum, which speaks to the imagination. The original museum actually housed, and I said it a little bit before already, the original museum actually houses three museums. One, the Museum of Painting. Here you see the Jewish Bride by Rembrandt. The other, the Museum of National History. And the third, the Museum of Applied Arts. Fascinating. Here you see the first floor, the Bel Etage, which imitates a Dutch church, the architecture of a Dutch church. This was the situation at the, be at the beginning of the 20th century. It was also a museum which was quite new in the way that it was a, a daylight museum, something that a lot of museums shun today because it's not that good for the, uh, the works of art exhibited. And also, we were dealing now with a collection of over 6,000 paintings, where we started in the 19th century with a collection of 500 paintings. So a lot of the windows were closed and now have paintings hanging on them. The Rijksmuseum is, in a sense, the national memory of the country. It's a little bit as your own memories. Um, you order them, or at least I order them, um, in important moments of your life, the moment you fall in love, the moment you have children, etc., etc. And these moments are in a chronological order. The Rijksmuseum tells the story, not of one person, but of a country from the 9th century up to the 20th century. So it seems very logical, like your memories, they're often visual images, it seems very logical to order these visual images chronologically. Well, also, this was complete blasphemy at the time, because at the time of postmodernism, history and time were just concepts which needed to be deconstructed. We felt that it was a very good ordering principle that, on the one hand, gives the public beacons on which they can hold on to. On the other hand, it also leaves space for the imagination. 
So we started where before you would have the curator of ceramics who would start his galleries with the Middle Ages up to the 20th century. Then you would have the curator of paintings who started his or her gallery with paintings up to the 20th century, etc., etc. They all had their little fiefdoms. So it was quite isolated. We said, might it be much more interesting for the public to give them one overview of Dutch culture from the Middle Ages to the 20th century. Well, that's where the discussions started, because everybody before had their own galleries. And we developed a very simple motto, which is to develop with the public a sense of time and a sensibility for beauty. And I'll give some um, examples of how we tried to tell history through art. This is the first known painting of a North African man probably working at the Spanish court in Antwerp. And it doesn't, it's not only a beautiful painting, but it also immediately gives you an impression of what a North African nobleman looked like, how he would dress, etc., etc., and what the court in Antwerp, which was where the ruler of the Netherlands was, was so important and what it, what it really felt like. And again, this very clear distinction and the reason for the Dutch to become independent, Catholics and Protestants. This is a painting by Van der Venne, Adrian van der Venne, where we see on the one side here, we see the Catholics dressed in red and the bishop and monks trying to fish for souls. The painting is also called The Fishing for Souls, painted around 1600. On this side, we see the Dutch Calvinist burghers dressed in black, also fishing for souls. Obviously, Van der Venne being Protestant shows us that they're far more successful. One could actually doubt it, because the boat is not yet tilting, while the boat of the Catholics is already tilting. Maybe because it's so full, but anyway. Um, I always love these, these, these people swimming. I love people swimming in paintings. You don't see it that often. But anyway, this doesn't only give a sense of beauty, because it's an early Dutch landscape, as you see in the background, very much inspired by the landscapes of the Flemish, an early Dutch landscape with a horizon so far, um, but on the other hand, it also gives us a, a, a sense of time, because it's a very specific moment of time in Dutch history. The Dutch are at war with the Spanish. And fascinatingly enough, they both have their golden ages in painting. We will have an exhibition next year together with the Prado on the two golden ages, Velasquez and Rembrandt, Vermeer, Ribera. They will all be shown alongside these two countries that were at war, that didn't have much contact, but at the same time were preoccupied by religion and by realism. The Night Watch, the painting around which the Rijksmuseum was constructed. You saw a photograph of the Mona Lisa before. Luckily, the Night Watch is very big, so when you come to Amsterdam, it's always crowds of people in front of it, but you can at least see it. It makes it a very interesting museum, which at the same time, like the Louvre, has a lot of freedom, because it's, in a sense, a museum that has one star piece, where people really come from all all over the world, so it generates always an attendance and it gives you freedom to do other things, to do research, etc., etc. <laughs> um, 
another way of telling history is history on the one hand biblical this is a, a, an image of the Jewish bride on the other hand telling a very personal story and it is a portrait historie so these two people lived in the 17th century they were probably inhabitants of Amsterdam we don't know who they are but we do now know what it actually represents and it represents a very moving story we always, it was always known as the Jewish bride. This was mainly to do with when it was sold at the beginning of the 19th century. Um, it went unsold quite a few times. Nobody wanted to buy it, and there was a big fashion for Jewish um, depictions. So the then British dealer thought, if I call it the Jewish bride, somebody will buy it. And indeed, it was immediately bought by a Dutchman. But at the beginning of the 20th century, it was discovered that it actually shows Isaac and Rebecca. And this, I'm just going to tell the story because it's, for me, a very moving story, but it's also a story which is very much about today. You also, when you know the story, start to understand what's happening here because everybody, it's, it's a great moment of intimacy, but who is he? Is he her father? Is she his daughter? Are they married? Um, why does he put his hand on her chest? Why does she look as if she's doubting? Um, uh, uh, is it a kind of Me Too affair? Or what's happening here? Um, Isaac and Rebecca in the Old Testament husband and wife have to flee into the country of the Philistines he um, thinks that the best way to protect his wife is to pretend as a refugee is to pretend that he is her brother in that case it would save her for being raped and in a moment, the first moment that they are in the country of the Philistines, a moment that they think that nobody will see them in a courtyard, they embrace in secret, husband and wife pretending to be brother and sister. And this is the moment that they embrace. But at that exact moment, the king of the Philistines, Abimelech, opens the window above them in the courtyard and catches them out. He finds them out. So obviously a very dramatic moment because they certainly know that they will die. And what does Rembrandt do? There, was, there wasn't, he probably didn't know any representation of this subject, and Rembrandt does that very often. He chooses the moment just before the king discovers them, and he does not depict the king. In a preliminary drawing which he made, he does have here a window with the king leaning out of it. But by leaving it out in the painting, you and I become the king who finds them out. We become the ones who actually will um, decide on their destiny. And they haven't yet realized that we are looking and are still in a tender embrace and she doubting obviously very much, can we actually embrace yes or no? I think it's, it's one of the most intimate and one of the most moving depictions um, of love in a very treacherous place. Rembrandt, in that sense, is an artist who pays a tribute to us as human beings. And I think that that's why he appeals still so much to us today. So this is seen from ancient history, and here we go to a painting known as The Little Street by Vermeer of the history of the 17th century. So this mixing of history and art in the Netherlands is particularly um, apt because the Dutch, during Protestantism, stopped painting scenes from Christ's life because the churches couldn't have any paintings um, 
depicting Christ's life, stopped depicting also for private devotion, and they started to explore for the first time different subjects. So the genre of the street scene, the city view, was created in the 17th century in Amsterdam, and in a sense you could call it the first Instagram. And I say it maybe jokingly, but it is that for the first time artists really started to look at the world around them, depict the world around them, was a great fascination, which you also have on social media now, for detail and for recording details. And I always say that in a sense, this is the most beautiful plastered wall that I've ever seen, with all its decay and all the, the way he recreates it. And Vermeer also is the street in front and the little street going to the back where somebody is cleaning a bucket. In the exhibition, which I actually I have to ab admit that the exhibition with the Prado, which Miguel and I um, uh, uh, had the idea of, I think already in 2002, the the uh, wish for me was to have this next to Velasquez's uh, depiction of the Medici Garden, because I think that will just be to die for. So, so I hope you go and see it. It will be in the Prado next year and then in the Rijksmuseum. Um, the construction of the city of Amsterdam also forms part of the history of the Rijksmuseum. The most ambitious urban planning project after Versailles of the 17th century. And this painting um, by Berkheide, it is what we call the, the golden curve um, in the Herengracht, one of the canals in Amsterdam, depicts the palaces of the richest people in the Netherlands. They could all buy a plot of, so the, the city designed the, the form of the canals, and every individual could buy a plot of land, and here you see them still building their city palaces. They are tiny if you compare it to what was built in Spain or what was built in Italy. But the Netherlands not only is a tiny country, but it is also a country of merchants. Merchants who always had to keep their money um, uh, at hand and not invest in bricks because they had to invest for their, uh, for their businesses. And that's one of the reasons, or actually the main reason, why Dutch houses, in a sense, are simple and tiny because the merchants didn't want to invest in bricks. It is built in the year 1672. The young, we know exactly why, because these buildings weren't built yet, and then a year later, uh, trees will line the canals. Um, fascinatingly enough, 1672 was a disastrous year for the Netherlands, for the Young Republic, because we were about to be invaded not only by France, but also by Germany and England. So that was the, that was the downside of not belonging to Spain anymore. Um, and there were great riots in the streets and the stock markets, because the Dutch were very much into stock markets, they nearly invented it, the stock markets kept on going down and the most famous poet of the country wrote a small poem about this painting saying, merchant merchant, don't invest in bricks, but invest in paint, referring to this painting, much better of course working in a museum I would also say that uh, <laughs> um, it ended very badly for the treasurer of um, the Netherlands, the year 1672. Um, he and his brother, who were the most powerful men in the country, were um, fleeced um, and they were, they were gutted um, in The Hague. Very cruel. This is actually, in a sense, a 17th century horror show. Um, and immediately the sale, again, of body parts of theirs, and especially their tongue sold for a huge amount of money because like me they talk too much um, uh, was immediately there started to be a, a, a trade in those and um, they were soon to be forgotten so again this sense of time but also a sensibility to art in the museum 
this is the painting by San Redam that I wanted to show and this was the example of originally a Catholic church turned Protestant that the architects in the 20th century used to deprive the Rijksmuseum of all its decorations. I think it's a, I don't really have words for it but I think it's an amazing painting especially because it's a very it's a very uh, personal document of San Ridam. this is the tombstone of his father so he painted this after the death of his father with the tombstone of his father and here he writes a sentence that I think kind of shows great humility because he, he writes the church of Assendelft, a village somewhere in the Netherlands, somewhere in Europe so it really is a, a kind of eco document of the artist again a sense of time and a sense of beauty. Skating scenes are very much a Dutch thing because as we say, on the ice everybody is the same. We all fall, we all stand up, class, it doesn't matter, everybody is the same. And the Dutch are a very egalitarian society and therefore also, I remember at the opening of the museum, we had to shake hands with 20,000 people and there were 20,000 people who all all contributed to the new Rijksmuseum. They all helped build this new building. And yes, it took a while. And yes, I would complain endlessly about it. Just imagine the meetings with 20,000 people. I would complain endlessly about it. But it is something that marks the, the, the country, a country which is very egalitarian. But there's also a different side of the country, and that's the side that we um, uh, there's more and more a longing to be told about it, which is how the Dutch made their wealth, and that was through a large part of the colonies. And here it is, more the story which is not told, like in this painting. You see it as a little bit of door painting. Um, they're not trees that grow in the Netherlands, they grow in, 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 in Bilbao I've seen but this is actually the West Indies um, the Caribbean the Surinams to be more specific and to be even more specific a plantation called Freedom in the Surinam but there wasn't any freedom there. The painter Dirk Falkenberg painted this for the mayor of Amsterdam who inherited these, this plantation and six others in the Suriname, but he never went there and he sent the painter to actually make a visual, a visual um, image or to, to, to make a visual document of these plantations. It looks very nice, but this was actually the scene just before this was painted where there was a huge uprising of 153 enslaved people in 1706 of slaves we have very little but we do have images like these that in their silence tell the story of Bataram, Mingo and Vali whose story we know very well because they came to trial in the Suriname for this uprising and their life story was noted down very precisely. So through he research in the recent years we are able to tell the personal life of people, people who actually usually don't have a name, we can give them a place again and a name again. In uh, 2020, we're organizing an exhibition on slavery in the Netherlands. We're telling 10 stories, it's 10 rooms, 10 stories of 10 slaves of whom we know the name. So that's also the function of a museum to, be, to take its position in society, to be part of it, and to be part, on the one hand, of its history, but also in making its future. I'm going to skip this one. Um, 
the Museum also of Applied Arts, where now the Applied Arts like this um, wonderful doll's house, which was not made to play with, it was made to be the woman's duty, the lady of the house's duty, um, to keep its inventory, each object in it. And you see here, you see nearly, you would think it's Missoni, but it's actually 17th century. Um, here you see each object is made by a different artist. There's an inventory of it, and it was, the cost of it was the same. It's all covered in silver and tortoise shell, like as if it's a bull cabinet. The cost of it was as much as one of the city palaces. So there were hugely precious objects, not to be played with, but mainly used by the, by the lady of the house to instruct her daughters on how to run the perfect household. Then we have the 18th century and the 19th century with the first self-portrait by Van Gogh. Van Gogh painted in a very dark style. His brother writes him a letter, and that's a great thing with Van Gogh. We've got the letters. His brother writes him a letter and says, if you want to sell paintings in Paris, you should paint in lighter colors, and you should paint portraits. Well, nobody wants to sit for him, so he starts to paint himself. And this is the first result. We now live in the 21st century, and I think most people in this room, like me, will have the, um, the quite annoying re realization that we are actually part of history, because we were all born in the 20th century, um, and we felt that you can't close the collection of a museum. You have to continue. So we, we started collecting 20th century art, and we started with this fantastic aeroplane, in the First World War, the Dutch were neutral. Um, we, we produced, and the Dutch have always done this, the arms trade was very profitable. We started to produce airplanes, this one by the Bantam, by Kohlhofer, for the British. And on the other side, we sold Fokker airplanes to the German. Well, you can understand that that was quite a profitable business because they started to bomb each other. Um, but it is part of the history, and also it shows in, in the room with Richard Hung the development of the stale. This is a, a chair by Rietveld. You probably know it in different colors, but he produced this together with a, with a, um, with a Dutch-Hungarian uh, artist for a very specific house, um, which was all white. It's from 1921, so it's a very early example of his chest. The interior of the museum was designed by a Frenchman, Jean-Michel Villemont, and of course, together with the curators. And this is what you get when you put all the curators, which was including me, in one room. They all start to make lots of plans and have to kind of leave the room shouting because they want to exhibit one more painting or one more piece of ceramic. And obviously, it doesn't fit. After four years, we had been able to reduce the amount of objects in the museum to 20,000 objects, and now we're open, we opened with 8,000 objects in the end. So that was elimination, 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 with always the, um, the, the point of departure that the works of art should appeal to the public and they should ask questions, because art should ask questions. You can nearly touch the works of art. I think that that's a great, a great um, uh, thing that uh, Villemot did, especially with his showcases. They are so transparent. Uh, here you see one, although it has a big sign what's going in it. This was before the opening. But they are incredibly transparent, and I think at a certain point I think said to him, the next showcase you will design will be no showcase, because it really evaporates in, our, in, in the air. And you have the feeling I think that the works of art are presented to you on a plate as the public. So you actually feel um, as if you're getting a present every 
time you see it. When combining works of art, paintings and objects, you need a lot of space because you also want to be able to appreciate the work of art on its own and not always in combination with other things. So we did find that we had to eliminate quite a lot of works and as a result we change often in the rooms so people do get to see the, the collection which is over a million objects. fantastic again I took this one it's, it's a beautiful piece by Van Viana who, who designed it, um, a, a style which was kind of it's called Eurekular style which is a completely wild kind of strange monstrous forms in the 17th century but this great, it's a great work of art but it also depicts an important battle against um, the Spanish it used to be installed with the silver in the silver gallery and now it's installed in the room which is about the birth of the young republic with objects that all relate to it In the corners of the museum, we show international art. There's a small international collection, but here you see the Amour Ménaissante um, made for Madame Pompadour, and one of the only three existing um, uh, works of art by Piranesi, a table. We did want to give an idea of the of the of, of the entire depth of the collection, so we created on one floor treasure rooms, which show great numbers of glassware, of silver, of porcelain, etc., etc. An important part of the identity of a museum is also the logo and typography. And in this case, again, we wanted simplicity. And Irma Baum, who you see here, designed the logo of the Rijksmuseum. And it seems so simple. But again, here there was a competition, and we had many frills and things and many crazy ideas about the logo. And she said, why don't you just use the name, because it's so unpronounceable for foreigners that they have to remember it and it is a very strong uh, name. She designed the guidebooks and she also had part, was part of the design of the website although I have to say Irma loves making books and is not so much in the in into the internet. What we felt, and which was essential, was that in the Rijksmuseum, the public gets as much authenticity as possible, because that's why you go to a place. Outside of the Rijksmuseum, we try to be as high-tech as possible. So low-tech in the museum, high-tech outside the museum. And the great thing about computers, and we see it um, because the is that they're about images and the power of the image that's also the business of the museum and they're about looking watching so as we call it you learn to look through watching they're accessible 24-7, and another great thing is you can actually touch the image. You can touch uh, the work of art, zoom in, etc., etc. Furthermore, we felt we want to be present on strange places. So as we gave the images of the Rijksmuseum, I think we gave them, uh, everybody has free access to them, everybody can download them in the highest resolution, and everybody can do with them whatever they want. And the idea behind that is that I remember as an art historian, I would used to clip images from newspapers, I would put them in a little folder and think, okay, I'm going to use them in the future, and obviously when the future arrives, you can't find the folder you put them in, but the action of clipping 
actually makes you remember the image or the newspaper article. So when you do something with an image, you start to um, appropriate it in a sense. And that was the idea, because all museums obviously digitized, that was the idea behind Rake Studio. And that was the idea of the designer who made these dresses, which images of the museum. You just saw this Vermeer. And we felt, and this is also a typical Dutch thing, that we should be present in every room, in every, uh, at every breakfast table. These are milk cartons, and museums are there to please, but they're also there to learn. And we made little riddles. I don't know if you remember that you sit as a child at the breakfast table and you look into the into the carton, and um, you could you could read a riddle from which you would learn something about the image from the Rijksmuseum. Here you see the milkmaid, which is obviously very apt. We were very insecure, um, I think, around 2000, saying there was Bill Gates who said, I will have in my house in Seattle large plasma screens where I will have the masterpieces of the world um, rotating, so I don't need art in real. I can have it on a screen. Um, and everybody's traveling, so what is the function of a museum? And I think, in hindsight, and that's always, all, uh, always easy, I think that the answer was in the question. Because everything is in a virtual world accessible, people want the real thing. They want to see the real object. And because everybody can travel, people find specific places which distinguish themselves, like the building, but also the collection. They find them very important because that's why they travel. So today, having given for free all the digital images of the Rijksmuseum, more and more people come to the museum. Don't worry, they're not often these queues. You can walk around the museum freely. And at the opening, we had fireworks, which there should be in every opening, I think, because I love fireworks, just like the Spanish. And musicians, the Dutch have brass bands for every province of the country, and they passed. And we, it, it, you, this also symbolizes the colors of the Netherlands, orange um, and uh, red, white and blue. It also symbolizes how much it is a museum of everybody and for everybody. People come to uh, marvel, they come to wander around the museum, they come to learn in the museum, and we see that really our public has changed hugely. And in the end, it's a museum about us as human beings. You might recognize the back of this hat, but this was actually is not, was hanging in the White House because it's Obama's favorite painting. Um, a painting of Rembrandt is one of his last self-portraits, which is, in a sense, it always reminds me of the Billy Holiday song, which is All of Me, Why Not Take All of Me? It is him in all his sorrow, in all his loss, in his bankruptcy, after losing his wife, after losing his children, all of me, why not take it? And here is Chilida. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a coincidence, <laughs> but I think it's a great thing to have to have these sculptures, um, which I was impressed how heavy they are. We had to kind of do huge installations to get them there, but once they're there, they in a sense defy gravity and take the space in silence. They don't shout, but they're there, and the presence I hope will be there for a long time. I'll shut up. Thank you very much. Um, if you'd like to ask questions, please do.
tardes. Buenas tardes. Quería preguntar la reordenación de las colecciones, ¿en qué medida cree que ha afectado a la experiencia de los visitantes? Sorry, do I understand that to what sense I feel that the collections have an impact on the visitors? On the visitors' experience. Uh, I, I think the visitors want, they come, I mean, we're all animals of habit, so the visitors come to the museum to, because the museum has collections. Um, and I think that the collection makes the museum. And that's also, you, I think the pride of, of, of the, the people of, of the collections um, of the museum is big. And I think you want to create a space where people people are able to see the collections at their best, but there are also uh, more and more spaces for people to look at other people, to be together somewhere, because I think that in cities nowadays we have a lot of, of, of um, uh, people who feel lonely or isolated or tend to be isolated, and museums are public spaces where people can meet, and even if they don't talk to each other, they can, they can look at each other, which can be quite exciting um, and they can also um, uh, enjoy something together um, so I think that the collections are, 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 are pivotal. I mean without collections no museum for the Netherlands at least for this for this museum well first of all thank you for your conference and um, Well, I want to know if you could extend a little bit more on the relation with the museum has with the contemporary art, please. Maybe regarding the temporary exhibitions, or if you could extend a little, a little bit more, please. Well, we don't acquire, in general, um, rules are always very nice because you can break them, but we don't acquire, in general, contemporary art because we are a museum um, that the works of art that are in the museum withstood the tooth of time. I think that the, the, the collecting of contemporary art is a very different uh, skill um, and we do what we do do is we sometimes sporadically um, invite contemporary artists um, to, to do work there. We had the work of um, uh, Frank Auerbach um, who is obsessed uh, in, in many ways but also obsessed with Rembrandt. Um, we juxtaposed um, paintings by Anish Kapoor uh, with Rembrandt because they were their paintings that are digging under the surface, like Rembrandt digs on the su under the surface um, of his subject. And um, we're now planning, and I'm not telling with whom, but we're planning to work with, a, with another contemporary artist. But those are always temporary uh, displays. And I think that they give the great thing of exhibiting contemporary art next to, um, to, to old art is not that you attract a younger public, because young people also come to look at Rembrandt and Vermeer and it's contemporary art but contemporary art does give you the possibility to look through the eyes of an artist at the collection. So when uh, Auerbach's work was there you could look in a sense through Auerbach's art, um, perspective through his eyes um, at Rembrandt and I think that that was a, a huge um, that gives, gives a huge surplus um, to the collection. I was shocked though because he was in the Gallery of Honor that um, there were people writing letters saying how dare you um, because today, nowadays you get for everything you get death threats so that's not something that's very interesting but you get how dare you exhibit a foreign artist in our national gallery and I think that that's something that we now have a exhibition program which shows that art doesn't have borders that's also why we work together with Spain because the Rijksmuseum as a collection was quite, as I tried to explain, quite national and also quite nationalistic in the 19th century. And I think especially in a time like this, we have to be very outspoken uh, against the idea that art belongs to a country and that countries are, um, are isolated bubbles. To 
and you cannot be, I think that, that we all in the past we thought that museums could be objective, but it is impossible to be objective, and I think that sometimes you just have to speak out. Thank you. Thank you for your conference. Um, in a museum with uh, such a deliberate national personality, as you said, uh, I'd like to know if you feel that the new approach is a still an instrument of Dutch national propaganda uh, when addressed to foreign visitors. I think that we... Um there's two sides of it. I think that for the people living in the Netherlands, the Rijksmuseum, and that's also what makes it special, the Rijksmuseum is like the royal family or the Dutch football team. People really identify with it. But I think it's our task not to make it into this um, kind of national propaganda. Because if you look at, well, I mean, the, the national hero in a sense, Rembrandt, he doesn't belong to the Netherlands. He's as much French or Indian or, I mean, every Everybody in the world uh, loves him when they are they get the opportunity to see his work. So I think the great thing about art is you can be the custodian of it, but because you can't really own it, even if you buy it, it's something that that's part of us, uh, of of mankind. So I think that we try. With the opening, we started to do a series of books on the on the relation of the Netherlands with other countries, and we now just uh, close an exhibition on which was called. Called High Society on the on the full length portrait throughout Europe and the States. So you do. Um, we now have a very international um, exhibition program to counterbalance that. Um, but I think you do have to do things that are part of your what the museum is. So we wouldn't start to exhibit treasures from Tutankhamun or something because that just it wouldn't feel right. Good. Well, thank you very much.